Uh, good evening. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Michael Trevis. I am the Martin Executive Editor. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for coming uh, here tonight for the final argument of the 47th uh, Annual Orison S. Martin uh, Moot Court uh, Competition. I want to uh, thank all of the competitors that competed both in the, the preliminary round and in the semifinal, uh, and want to congratulate our four, uh, our four finalists um, who are here uh, today. Um, by way of, uh, to introduce our, our, our competitors, uh, we have uh, Jeremy Brinster who we and uh, Catherine Stein, who will be representing the appellant, uh, David Moosman and Mandy Shu uh, representing the appellee. Um, uh, by way of our panel, uh, we have Chief Judge, our Jug Chief Judge Diane Wood, who will be representing, or will be serving as our Chief Judge, uh, and Judge uh, Sri Srinivasan and uh, Judge Jane Strange. Um, uh, the uh, clerk will call the court to order. All rise. The Honorable, the Chief Judge and Judges of the United States Court of Appeals for the 14th Circuit. Oye, oye, oye. All persons having business before the Honorable of the United States Courts of Appeals for the 14th Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Please be seated. Appellant Brinster, do you wish to reserve rebuttal time? Yes, one minute, please. Appellant Stein, do you wish to reserve rebuttal time? Yes, two minutes, please. We are here this afternoon to hear arguments in the case of Richard Chase against Plainsboro University, and I would invite the first uh, advocate to step up. Good evening. Chief Judge, your honors, and may it please the courts. My name is Jeremy Brinster, and I am representing the appellant Richard Chase in this matter. Your honors, the court below held that Title VII precluded employees of federally financed educational institutions from suing under Title IX. We respectfully ask this court to reverse that judgment for three reasons. First, Title VII and Title IX do not protect identical rights. Rather, they are vastly different statutes with different purposes and different scopes. Second, Congress intended for Title VII and Title IX to provide independent remedies for sex discrimination in employment. And third, Richard Chase properly sued under Title IX for monetary and injunctive relief for the discrimination that he suffered at the hands of Appellee Plainsboro University. Now, counsel, the Supreme Court of late has been very careful about expansions of spending clause legislation, such as Title IX. And we do have a very well elaborated set of remedies for people who have suffered employment discrimination in Title VII. So why should we allow people to sidestep the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, and fail to use those remedies? Your Honor, I think it gets to the point that suing under Title IX for employment discrimination rather than under Title VII doesn't undermine the scheme that Congress established under Title IX. In fact, under even Title VII, do you mean to sorry, say? Sorry, Your, Your yeah. Honor, yes, under Title VII. It doesn't undermine that scheme. Because even if it might be our policy preference to channel every employment discrimination claim through Title VII, we cannot substitute our judgment for that of Congress. And Congress indicated throughout the legislative history, the text, and the structure of the two statutes at issue that Title VII and Title IX were meant to provide separate and independent remedies for employment discrimination on can, the basis of Can you of sex. give us some other examples of where parallel systems like that have been um, acknowledged by the Supreme Court or the Courts of Appeals? Absolutely, Your Honor. So I would point first to Johnson v. Railway Express Agency, in which the Supreme Court held that Title VII did not preempt a private right of action under the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Rather, both of those statutes provided independent remedies for race discrimination in employment. So they, they might be independent remedies. I mean, they have to be if one's coming up under one statute and another's coming up under, under another statute. But from the perspective of Title IX, it's an implied cause of action, right? Mm -hmm. yes, and so if it's an implied cause of action, it just seems to me, as the judiciary, we ought to be pretty circumspect in how we fashion an implied cause of action because we don't have any guidance from Congress. And when I think about being circumspect about fashioning 
an implied cause of action, what I think about is, well, let me look to other analogous statutory regimes to make sure that I'm not doing something as a member of the judiciary that it's in derogation of something that Congress wanted to do. And when I do that, I look at the obvious example, which is Title VII. And why shouldn't I, if I want to be circumspect about the way I fashion an implied cause of action, be really reluctant to cast out and create a remedy that's even broader than the one that Congress fashioned when it specifically thought about this very issue? Your Honor, I understand your caution, but I would point to a few reasons why, first, the Supreme Court has not been quite as cautious to expand uh, this private right of action under Title VII. First, it recognized the private right of action in the first place in Cannon v. University of Chicago. And then in Jackson v. Birmingham Board of Education, it held that an employee had a private right of action under Title IX for retaliation. And it also it concluded under Franklin v. Gwinnett County Public Schools that um, and under Title IX, Congress intended to make damages available under a private right of action. And, and all of that is, is exactly consistent with Title VII. I don't, I don't think anything that you've listed so far points up an inconsistency with Title VII. But if we recognized an implied cause of action that allowed, say, for a statute of limits that's a lo lot longer than the one under Title VII, then unlike recognizing a cause of action, unlike recognizing that it encompasses damages, we'd be fashioning it in a way that goes beyond Title VII. Well, Your Honor, I would point to a few aspects of the legislative history in which con the Congress had enacted Title IX concluded that Title IX was meant to provide very broad remedies. So first, Congress considered making Title VII the exclusive remedy for employment discrimination claims, but it chose not to do so. And second- But uh, can I just interject? It didn't reduce that thought to statutory language. Title IX, as my colleague has said, um, is in the realm of the implied private right of action. I granted now for injunctions, for damages, it's, the Supreme Court has stood behind that, but nonetheless, um, aren't we still in the realm where we wanna be careful about imputing to Congress too much? Well, Your Honor, I would point to a textual instantiation of Congress's intent to make sure that Title IX provided broad remedies, and that is that Congress modeled Title IX off of Title VI, which prohibits uh, race discrimination by federally funded educational institutions. And Title IX is nearly a carbon copy of Title VI, but it does leave out one important aspect of Title VI's framework, which is the language of Title VI that exempts employers. And so when Congress enacted Title IX, it already knew that Title VI had been interpreted to provide a judicially implied private right of action. And yet it copied the operative language of Title VI and then excised Title VI's exemption for employees. So that indicates that Congress intended for Title IX to provide a private right of action that also extended to employees. So it, it does extend to employees, I guess. Title IX extends to employees, we know that. But the question is whether the private cause of action extends to employees in a way that's in conflict with Title VII. Yes, right. Your Honor. That's the case. And we would argue that the private right of action does apply to employees as well, because Congress and the Supreme Court, when they, first Congress when it passed Title IX, and in later Congresses, when Congress revisited Title IX after certain Supreme Court decisions that were adverse to Congress's intent, for instance, Grove City College v. Bell, Congress actually went in, it saw that the Supreme Court had unjustifiably narrowed the scope of, um, of individuals to whom Title IX offered relief, and it went in and tinkered with the statute and actually made sure that Title IX had what it called in its committee reports a, quote, broad institution-wide application. And so I think that's one example of Congress indicating that all individuals, no matter what their relationship to educational institutions, deserve Title IX's coverage. And I would also point to the Third Circuit in Doe v. Mercy Catholic Medical Center, the Third Circuit noted that it was, quote, the plaintiff's characteristics, for example, whether she's an employee, a student, or something else, that they're not, uh, they might be relevant in some cases, but they're not necessarily dispositive. It's actually the defendant's status as an, as an educational institution that activates Title IX's protections. And the, has the method of analyzing cases developed differently over time? A number of the cases on which you rely, were it's the 70s or the 80s, and now we seem to have walked into a more textually interested world. And I'm thinking of Fitzgerald, which is 2009, nearer mm -hmm. to the analysis today, um, where in talking about preemption, what they looked to was the primary emphasis on the nature and extent 
of the statute's remedial scheme. Does that impact your analysis that now we are looking more to whether there is a remedial scheme that controls as opposed to a perhaps prior emphasis on legislative history? Your Honor, I don't think that undermines my argument because I would point to the fact that many of the cases in which the Supreme Court has found that one statute precludes relief under another, those are really based on the idea that both statutes at issue protect identical rights. And an example of that is in Great American Federal Savings and Loan Association v. Novotny. The court held that a plaintiff could not sue under the Civil Rights Act of 1871 simply to assert a conspiracy to violate Title VII. Those two statutes in that instance were protecting the exact same rights. And by contrast, Title VII and Title IX protect different substantive rights. And that goes right to what the Supreme Court has said as recently as- Can you explain what you mean by that? Because I thought there was quite an overlap. Yes, Your Honor. There is absolutely an overlap. But it gets back to the point that Congress made when it held that Title VII did not preclude the Civil Rights Act of 1866, even though both statutes had overlapping protections for race discrimination. Right. But I mean, I'm thinking, you know, Title IX protects people who happen to be in educational institutions that receive federal funds from sex discrimination. Title VII specifically lists sex discrimination as one of the criteria if that person happens to be an employee. Looks like a pretty good fit to me. Your Honor, when the Supreme Court considers whether one statute precludes relief under another, it looks to see whether the two statutes have different purposes, have different scopes, and reach distinct cases. And all of those things are true about Title VII and Title IX. In Gebser v. Lago Vista Independent School District, the Supreme Court noted that the two statutes have different purposes, whereas Title VII primarily aims to compensate employees who have already suffered discrimination. Title IX aims to protect individuals against discrimination by educational institutions before that discrimination actually occurs. But you know, Title VII has injunctive provisions, indeed started out that way. And so did Title IX. The court recognizes that you can have damages in a Title IX case. Now you can have damages in a Title VII case. For the individual person complaining, I can certainly see that Title IX protects people who are not employees. But I take it that everyone concedes that Mr. Chase, for our purposes, is an employee, that he is not a student at this facility. Your Honor, I would make the point that Richard Chase is both a student and an employee at the university. And I think that the burden of drawing a line between pure students on the one hand and pure employees on the other hand really illustrates why Title IX's private right of action should extend to both. I think that- But I assume you'd be making the same argument even if it was a pure employee. Yes, Your Honor. Your argument doesn't change based on the fact that he may be both a student and an employee. Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. The fact that Richard Chase is both a student and an employee really makes salient why he needs the Title IX relief in this case. But it is true that Title IX's private right of action extends to all employees of educational institutions. And that's consistent with the intent of Congress. So can I ask you this? So as I understand Title VII, I believe that Title VII's provisions only apply to employers if there's a minimum number of employees. That's correct, Your Honor. So it's 15 or something? I can't remember the number. Is that right? Okay. So would your argument mean that even if you had an educational funding recipient that had fewer than 15 employees, that they would still have a private right of action even though Congress would have said in the Title VII context that they don't want a damages remedy for employers that have fewer than 15 employees? That's absolutely correct, Your Honor. And that gets to my point about why Title VII does not preclude Title IX because the two statutes reach distinct cases. And it's not just that an employee could sue under Title IX for some hypothetical educational institution that had fewer than 15 employees. It's that there are cases that Title VII reaches that Title IX does not. There's an example in Gebser, the Supreme Court considered a student's sexual harassment claim. And it held that while the student may have been able to use Title IX's substantive standards to meet the requirements for sexual harassment because Title VII only required constructive notice, she was not an employee and she was forced to sue under Title IX. And Title IX had a higher burden. It required actual notice of an employee's misconduct in order to actually award relief. And so the fact that those two statutes reach distinct cases is something that the court has pointed to to show that preclusion isn't there. Now, Your Honors, I would get back to the point that Title VII and Title IX also have different scopes. For instance, Title VII, as we know, lays out a general framework governing employee-employer relationships. 
It precisely identifies who is covered and who is not and how to obtain relief. On the other hand, Title IX simply has a broad prohibition on discrimination with only a small set of narrow exemptions. And Title IX's very broad protections, they ensure that employees like Chase, who are at the mercy of employers who can exact both professional and academic costs, have a way to hold their institutions accountable. But what was it that prevented Chase from filing a timely complaint with the EEOC? Your Honor, I would point to two things. The first is the timing here. So, plain, so Richard Chase, if he was not able to get relief very soon, he's not going to be able to complete his academic program. And Title IX's administrative scheme can take a very long time to, to fulfill, and that could set back a student who is at the mercy of their university. Um, you well, know, I, under, I understand your answer, I think, but forgive me, but I'm, I'm not sure the courts are always the speediest uh, in giving recovery for people. Your Honor, I absolutely understand, but at the same time, Richard Chase, by getting into federal court, does have a better chance, I believe, of making sure he gets that equitable relief he needs, because it's not clear that Richard Chase has effective equitable relief under Title VII. If Your Honor, Your Honor, I see I'm out of time, if I may briefly finish my points and conclude. You can finish your thought and then we'll move on. Sure. My point is that Richard Chase doesn't necessarily have effective equitable remedies under Title VII. For instance, could a Title VII victory enjoin the university from refusing to provide letters of recommendation for an academic program? Or could it force the university to enroll Chase in the maternal health research credit he was denied from? We very much doubt it. Now, Your Honor, okay, I, I think okay. I think you can Thank you. wrap up. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Stein. Madam Chief Judge, Your Honors, may it please the court. My name is Katherine Stein and I represent the appellant, Mr. Richard Chase. The inquiry facing this court is not simply which causation standard applies to Title IX retaliation claims, but rather whether the Supreme Court, in deciding a case in the Title VII context, implicitly altered a long-standing Title IX jurisprudence. It did not. This court should continue to use the motivating factor standard when evaluating Title IX retaliation claims for three primary reasons. The first, Nassar is not controlling beyond the ambit of Title VII. The court was very clear. Second, the statutory structures of Title IX and Title VII differ in precisely the ways that matter for purposes of evaluating the 1991 Act that Congress amended. And third, bedrock principles of statutory interpretation, as well as public policy, suggest that there must be a consistent standard for evaluating all Title IX claims. And so that what, standard. So when was the last time the Supreme Court adopted the motivating factor test? You, you mentioned Nassar, there's Gross. The, the court has been looking to but for causation as the default. And I don't see where in Title IX there's a signal that you're going to superimpose something beyond the default but for causation standard. Your Honor, the court has the Supreme Court has never decided that Title IX retaliation claims must be evaluated according to motivating factor. However, well or, or or anything else. I mean what I'm suggesting to you is its recent cases all seem to be going the but for causation direction. Of course if there's language in the statute, fine. There's language in the statute, but we don't have any language that resolves this. Your Honor, the Supreme Court in Jackson was the first time that the court actually gave uh, a plaintiff a remedy under for a retaliation claim. And what the court held there was that when, a, when an employer discriminates against a pl an employee because that employee complains of discrimination, that constitutes intentional discrimination on the basis of sex. That because of language in Jackson was in 2005. And it wasn't until 2013 when Nassar was decided that any court considered the standard to be anything but motivating factor. There was no district court, no appellate court, and as Your Honor has just referenced, not the Supreme Court that held that the standard was anything but motivating well, factor. Well, wouldn't the standard have been but for at least under the ADEA? Under because the ADEA, Your Honor? Under the ADEA, because Gross told us that the standard for ordinary discrimination under the ADEA is but for causation. I don't know what the argument would be to say that if it's but for causation for non-retaliation discrimination, that retaliation discrimination nonetheless should be motivating factor. So in both Gross and Nassar, the court was looking at statutory structures where retaliation and status-based claims were separate in the statute. There were separate provisions. 
So when the court was looking at the scope of Congress's affirmative decision to amend the Title VII in 1991 and add this motivating factor provision, what the courts were deciding in both Gross and Nassar was whether that decision applied to both types of claims. Now and that, what, that, that's fair enough, but, but what we have in Title IX is a black box, right? We have this structure that we're, make, we're, we're building um, and you're quite right that you don't have the kind of specific guidance, but when you fill in the blanks, so to speak, why shouldn't we follow the Supreme Court's latest guidance? For three primary reasons, Your Honor. The first is that, as Judge Strange just referenced, we are in a textually motivated world, whether that's in preemption or with respect to statutory interpretation. And arguably, in, in Nassar, what the court did was it looked at the retaliation provisions from Gross and from Title VII and found this because of language. So and what's your best language in Title IX to support your position? Your Honor, Title IX, if there is any causation standard that this court wants to cling to, is on the basis of. The phrase because of does not exist anywhere in Title IX. The phrase that is causally linked to the standard is on the basis of. And we've seen other anti-discrimination statutes where the term on the basis of has been interpreted not to mean but for causation, but rather much more akin to something like motivating factor. The ADA is a perfect example. When someone is discriminated on the basis of age, that means something like a motivating factor. The employee in that instance doesn't necessarily have to say that they would have been hired but for their age, rather that the employer took that into consideration. That's much more akin to motivating factor. In addition, this because of language- But the Supreme Court adopted but for, for the age, for the age discrimination, all the letters are a pain, uh, for the age <laughs> discrimination statute. But not necessarily for retaliation claim claims, Your Honor. But to the extent that this Wait, because... Wait, uh, that, uh, th can that be right? I mean, do you actually think that the court said in Gross that for the ADEA, did I get that right? <laughs> the ADEA. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, <laughs> for the ADEA, the standard for discrimination, the causation standard for discrimination is but four. I don't, are, are you suggesting that for retaliation claims under the ADEA, the standard would be anything other than but four? It might be, Your Honor. The, the point How, is why, that... What would that be based on? It, it would be based on the fact that there are separate provisions in the statute, which is exactly what is the case with Title VII. However, when you transpose- In the ADEA, there's a separate retaliation provision? There, there's not a separate retaliation, sorry, Your Honor. Are we referring to the ADEA or the Age Discrimination Act yeah, or the, the, the uh, whatever Americans gross, with Disabilities? The, no, the ADEA, okay. the Age Discrimination, the, the one that Gross construed, construed, right? Right. So the one that Gross construed, which is the Age Discrimination Act, yeah, let's make it easy, Age Discrimination Act. So under the Age Discrimination Act, we know that the, ca the causation standard for a standard discrimination claim of age discrimination is but four. Yes, I'm not right. aware of any reason we would suppose that even though the standard for causation standard for normal discrimination is but four, that the causation standard for a retaliation claim under the Age Discrimination Act would be rationed down a motivating factor. The court in Gross was specifically interpreted this because of language. That language exists both, as Your Honor has referenced, in the ADA and Gross, ADEA and Gross, and in Title VII and Nasser. That language notably does not exist in Title IX. And that's because where there was a split statutory structure in a case like Title VII, where the 1991 motivating factor provision could, there be, could then be cabined, that cannot exist in the Title IX context. In Title IX- yeah, Counselor, what about how this impacts reality under these statutes. Are you saying that under your policy it would be appropriate for a student to have an easier cause of action than someone who falls in the category of an employee? And likewise, should it be easier for an employee in a university to win his or her case than an employee in a private setting? Title IX, Title IX, yeah. I think so, Your Honor, actually, because Title IX does re require individuals to be the ones bringing the claims. That's how the statute is structured. So in some sense, it is that Title IX is supposed to have a broader reach. And that's exactly what the court held in Nassar when it was very clear that it wanted to cabin its decision in the Title VII context. A broader reach and an easier reach because we're on causation here. Yes, Your Honor, I think, that's, I think that's right, and I think that's what the court held in Nassar. And it was careful to differentiate between Title VII and Title IX when it did make that holding. In addition, the fact that Title IX permits people to bring retaliation claims at all was decided in Jackson. And what the court held in Jackson was that that is indeed a private right of action. That is indeed discrimination on the basis of sex.
And so if you look at the retaliation in the status-based provisions of the Title VII context, the court was very clear that, that the 1991 Act, which did indeed lower the standard from but for to motivating factor, the court did not simply just cabin that with respect to retaliation claims. It also effectuated it for status-based Title VII claims. And so if this court is going to continue to use Title VII jurisprudence to guide Title IX, which it absolutely will. The appellee does not concede that. In fact, they spend a significant portion of their brief dedicated to suggesting that this court should continue to use that framework, ignoring the fact that the court in Nassar effectuated that motivating factor provision for a significant portion of Title VII claims, ignores the import of that in the Title IX context. And that's because this court must decide a consistent causation standard no matter what type of claim a plaintiff brings under Title IX because there's only one cause of action in the statute. Unlike Title VII, where you can bring either a retaliation or a status-based claim, that's a bit of a misnomer in the Title IX context. Because Is it really? I mean, I, I had thought we'd been talking about um, a Title IX claim for just direct sex discrimination, which is part of what Mr. Chase is complaining about. He's been deprived of access to this program uh, on the basis of his sex, and that there are also harassment-based claims. There are also retaliation-based claims. It's just that they all fall under this umbrella language of Title IX. Absolutely, Your Honor, but that umbrella language is important because if this court is deciding what the standard is for Title IX retaliation claims, they're also you're also deciding what the standard is for Title IX status-based claims, and that's why it's important what, to know. And a status-based claim is? If an employer discriminates against an employee on the basis of sex. Just, just the straightforward, I would call it just the straightforward discrimination claim. Yes, Your Honor. That language is, is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So when this court is deciding yeah. what the standard is, they're deciding that standard for both types of claims. And you and think that, it's motivating factor across the board? Yes, Your Honor, for two primary reasons. First, as we started this conversation with, that has been the standard that courts have been applying for status-based or um, substantive Title IX claims. The court in the Second Circuit held that in Yusuf all the way back in 1994, and Doe in the Eleventh Circuit held that as recently as 2018. So that's the first reason. That has continued to be what the standard is for status-based or substantive Title IX claims. But the second reason is that this court's holding in Nassar was clear that that 1991 act that Congress affirmatively decided to pass when it amended Title VII is absolutely still operative in the Title VII context. So for Title VII status-based claims, that is the standard. But I, but I thought that you were drawing a distinction between Title VII and Title IX on the basis that Title IX uses particular language by reason of. Yes, Your Honor, there's, so, there's an important distinction to be made in terms of whether or not there's a strong textual argument to analogize directly between what this court said in Gross and Nasser about the term because of. But if this court does use Title VII jurisprudence as a general guide or does look to it in any sense, if the court wants to continue to do that, it must indeed look at what the court did in Nasser with respect to the general teeth of Title VII, which is this status-based claim. And now, is, it, is it your understanding that there can be only one but four cause of discrimination? Not necessarily, Your Honor. Not necessarily, Your Honor. There could be multiple but four causes. Um, there's also different types of causation. In fact, that's a separate that's a separate oh, question because there, because really the issue is whether or not it's but four or motivating factor. And because that standard that Congress passed in 1991 continues to apply to the majority of and the teeth of Title VII claims, there's no good reason why that shouldn't also apply in Title IX absent the direct holding of Nassar. And if your honors have no more questions, I'll just sum up briefly. This court should not blindly apply a case which decided a narrow question with an even narrower answer to an entirely different case, an entirely different statute, with very different facts that's supposed to have broad reach. Such a simplification leads to pernicious results that contravenes both common sense and proper legal analysis. This court should thus continue to use the motivating factor standard when evaluating Title IX retaliation claims. Accordingly, it should reverse the district court's order granting summary motion and should remand to the district court for further proceedings. All right, thank you. Mr. Moosman? Thank you, Chief Judge Wood, and may it please the court. 
My name is David Mosman, and I, along with my co-counsel, Madeline Shu, represent the Apple Lee Plainsboro University. I will address the question of whether Title VII provides the exclusive means for plaintiff to pursue his employment discrimination claim, while Ms. Shu will discuss the appropriate standard of causation for retaliation claim under Title IX. Your Honors, when Congress enacted Title VII, it provided a detailed, comprehensive remedial scheme the purpose of which was to allow for the efficient, swift, and amicable resolution of employment discrimination claims through reconciliation, not through litigation. So I, I want to introduce this first thought. I think it's important to understand um, that Title VII and Title IX differ from one another. As you say, Title VII offers the administrative process, which might be very attractive to some plaintiffs, in fact, not to have to bear the full cost of, of the mediation process. The EEOC is required to attempt to conciliate. There are a lot of uh, uh, requirements there. And so in some ways, Title VII has advantages to a plaintiff. There is uh, a remedial structure that, that's well established. In other ways, Title IX uh, is helpful. Uh, Title IX has a longer statute of limitations. If you do happen to be dealing with the educational sector, um, and yet the standard of proof is more difficult, at least in some instances, for the implied private right of action. So if we think of Venn diagrams, they overlap, but they're not coincident. And in many other areas, um, the Supreme Court has said people can choose. So why not here? Well, Your Honor, I think the best answer to that question is to look to the court's decision in Brown versus General Services Administration. Because in Brown, the court recognized the principle that even if you have two statutes that are concurrent in some respects but differ in others, the primary method of analysis is this. Where you have two potential paths to a remedy for a particular wrong, the statute that is detailed, precise, and comprehensive provides the method of relief. Well, they did say that. In other words, a very elaborate, and indeed is to this day, a very elaborate administrative structure for government employees. How would you answer this question? Suppose a person uh, who worked for the University of Wisconsin, uh, a state institution, uh, wanted to complain about race discrimination in employment, and that person could bring a Title VII case, that person could also bring a 1983 case. Are you going to force them into Title VII and say that 1983 is unavailable? Not at all, Your Honor. And the reason why is particularly with respect to the legislative history that Mr. Brinster already alluded to. In North Haven and in Cannon, the court looks extensively at the legislative history of Title IX. But we don't like legislative history anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think here- Or at least we're told not to. Uh, so. <laughs> Well, Your Honor, I think here it is still instructive because in, in the course of deliberating upon the enactment of Title IX, what Congress did is it said we have this existing body of anti-discrimination law, some of which is particularized to deal with state action and some of which are remnants of the earlier initial civil rights litigation after Reconstruction. We don't want to disturb the existing body of law because we believe it to be very effective in some instances. And as such, we specifically contemplate that, and we don't write in any exclusion provision at all. Now, Brown is a different circumstance, and but, I think- But can I take you for a moment back to a piece of the history that we surely should pay attention to, which is the 1972 amendments to Title VII that bring in state and local governments, and yet Congress, even then, doesn't say, and never mind your 1983 case anymore. It goes forward with full knowledge that these are parallel tracks. You might have said before the 1972 amendments you had to have 1983, but you certainly don't afterwards. Well, I, I would agree, Your Honor, in that if you look at the 1972 amendments in particular, one of the problems that Congress was particularly fixated upon was just the problem that arose in cases like this, instances wherein you had federal funding of educational institutions, and we want to be able to provide a mechanism for resolving those claims. And what Congress did is that it amended Title VII, as Your Honor noted, to apply to universities and schools. Well, to state entities of all kinds, actually. Certainly. The appellant's position in this case is that 
Mo mere months after the enactment of these amendments, and mere months after the extensive taking of testimony and consideration with respect to this core problem, the unavailability of, fe of remedies in the university context, title, uh, Congress passed a statute, Title IX, which while not addressing this issue in particular, and while having no particular administrative scheme, having no damages cap, having no statute of limitations, nevertheless provides a wholly alternative remedial well, so scheme. Let me ask you this question as, as, a, um, as a response to the argument you're just making. So suppose that in Title IX you had an express cause of action. It's not an implied cause of action, but it's, it's express. And all it says is there's a private cause of action under Title IX. So it gives, it makes clear that a private individual can bring a claim in court for redress. And under the Title IX decisions, we know that where there's a cause of action, that encompasses damages. Franklin tells us that. So it's just the normal things that come along with the cause of action. If there were an express cause of action that Congress put in Title IX, I don't think we'd be supposing that nonetheless we would transpose limitations from Title VII over to Title IX, because Congress would have provided for a cause of action without incorporating those limitations. Do you, do you agree with me on that? Uh, I agree with you, Your Honor, but I would like to offer a comment with respect so can to... I, let me just ask you this. Once you agree with me, and then, uh, and then you can get your comment. So <laughs> if you agree with me on that, then why would we, 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 would we be looking at it any differently just because it's an implied cause of action? Because all we're doing with an implied cause of action is recognizing that there's a cause of action. And why, once we have an implied cause of action, we just treat it as a cause of action that exists in the world. So now Title IX has a cause of action, just like the hypothetical, why would we transpose over something from an entirely different regime? Well, Your Honor, I think the teaching of Franklin and the cases it relies upon, that is for the proposition that where you have a cause of action, you generally have the whole panoply of remedies, i.e. equitable remedies, compensatory damages, punitive damages. The core proposition there is that it is a proposition about congressional intent. That is that Congress has intended that where you have a broad provision, generally speaking, so long as there's not a conflict with other existing statutory regimes, you have all the remedies you like. But this particular historical circumstance, I think, is very instructive because you have an instance in which Congress, after the 1972 amendments, in 1991, looks particularly at employment discrimination damages. Congress became particularly concerned about this problem, wherein you had broad and freewheeling damages claims that were well in excess of what was proportional. And Congress looks at title, looked at Title VII and said we're going to restrict damages in Title VII just the way Your Honor referenced. But at, our, at, at that point, there was already in existence an implied cause of action under Title IX, right? That's right, there was. And Congress didn't do anything about that. Well, <coughs> at that time, the court had not addressed the issue of whether damages were available. That, come, that came a bit later. They had only addressed the question in North Haven and in Cannon, of course, whether it was permissible for an employee to bring a claim. And indeed, in North Haven itself, which is the most significant preceding case with respect to the scope of the right of action, that was an instance in where the, the remedy at the end of the day was a remand to address the question of what equitable relief could proceed. It was not a damages claim at all. So but I would say- Isn't your argument, doesn't it effectively say that North Haven was wrong? I mean, that's above our pay grade, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Your Honor, I'm not asking you to overturn the Supreme Court. Um, Thank you. <laughs> They North Haven, also. <laughs> North Haven really is about the propriety of regulations under Title IX that are enacted by agencies to deal with this issue. I think it's clear from the legislative history, and we agree with the appellant on this issue, that employees do come within the ambit of a statute. That's what the broad term like person means. And what the agency had done there is that it had created regulations that specifically said individual employee, if you have an instance in which you see a misallocation of federal funds, or in an other conduct that is violative of the, of the requirements of Title IX, you can bring an individual action, seek injunctive relief, directing the defendant to engage in conduct that is not violative of the statute. But, but are you saying if the employee wants to say, I should have gotten that promotion and I didn't because I was the wrong sex or something? In other words, a more immediate thing that would be amenable to injunctive relief. Um, is, is there something different about that situation? Yes, Your Honor, our position is that, especially when you have the instance of an implied cause of action, and I think the court has already discussed that when you have an implied cause of action, you want to be a bit cautious about drawing its bounds too broadly. When you have an instance that is well within the ambit of the remedies available under Title VII, I think the instruction in Brown is that where you have the remedy available, 
where Congress has thought about the problem, has considered it, and has specifically talked about the applicability of a particular remedial scheme, an implied right of action should not be drawn in such a way as to provide a conflict with that remedial scheme. So I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing the huge problem with the conflict because even under your argument, we know that there's going to be Title IX claimants who have a private cause of action for discrimination and are going to bring their claim without, with nothing having to do with the EEOC, with nothing having to do with the statute of limits. They're going to, students can bring claims where there's a, nine, uh, there, you know, a much lengthier statute of limits than is available under Title VII. So we're already in a world in which Title IX actions sweep more broadly than what would be allowed under Title VII if it were an action by an employee. We're only talking about the universe of Title IX actions that involve claims by employees. But I don't, I'm not sure why we need to make sure that as to those, they marry with Title VII. Why wouldn't we level down instead of leveling up by saying that what they marry with is what happens with everything else under Title IX? Well, the reason why, Your Honor, is that when you have the student case, and I I understand that in the student case of the court has already established that you can bring a private uh, cause of action for damages. The issue is that you don't have another statute that has really contemplated the issue in particularity and said, look, Congress has a distinct policy on this question. And we think that the, uh, that the proper resolution of this class of claims, at least initially, is to provide a remedial mechanism that allows the employer and the employee to come together to address the factual bases for the purported uh, employment misconduct and to come to a resolution. But take this. Nothing prevents them from doing that, actually, in a, in a Title IX case or, for that matter, anything else. And I, I guess I'm still concerned about uh, why Title IX is, is such a problem when 1983 and other statutes where Congress has emphasized, they, they just stand side by side. They have different advantages, different pluses, different minuses. And if Congress wants to change that, they can. Think even of Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 54. You're entitled to whatever relief you can prove you're entitled to, roughly, is what that says. Uh, unless, of course, Congress has said no. But Congress didn't say no. Well, Your Honor, I, the, way, the reason why I would say that Title VII stand, and Title IX stand distinct from the statutes you referenced, like 1983, is that, fundamentally speaking, what happened in this instance is that Congress, A, fixated upon the initial problem, found that the currently existing statutory remedies like 1983, like 1981, to be able to effectively, they didn't want to cut off those existing statutes in 1964. But in 1972... Or, or, or 1972, or 1991. Well, I 1983 think, has survived through all those changes. Well, I agree 1983 has survived, and of course it has to do with the fact that there are going to be plenty of instances where you have an employment discrimination claim that may be cognizable, say, under Title VII or another... Are we talking state. 1983, the, the year, or 1983, the cause of action? I'm sorry, <laughs> oh, Section 1983. Oh, got it. Okay, got it. Uh, <laughs> there are going to be instances where there's a constitutional dimension to the conduct that it makes sense to differentiate between those classes of cases and the ordinary garden variety employment case. But this, I think... Uh, and frankly, the appellant has already, I think, not made an attempt to really differentiate this from the ordinary garden variety employment discrimination case. You don't have, I think, this is an instance in which they're saying, I was fired, or there was initially a material change to the conditions of my employment. So I'm, I'm just struggling with that, because what it seems to me is that you say this act has been um, altered along the way, and now we're in this situation where um, we accept parallel remedies that are historic, but we are enacting field preemption, complete preemption on remedies prospectively. Um, you know, the, the court has a great deal of experience with field preemption in the ERISA context, for example, and I think has backed off of field, pre field preemption in that arena. So, how would you, what is the argument that you would make to say that this is appropriate prospectively to preempt the field from the remedies world because they allow those remedies that were historically available to go forward? Well, I would cite an example, and this actually occurs in the habeas context. There's been, there have been instances in which uh, plaintiffs have tried to assert um, causes of action under statutes like 1983 mm -hmm on the basis that it was violative of, say, it was an impermissible uh, additional imprisonment, for example. The court has said, 
you have habeas, and habeas has particular procedural requirements. I see that, Your Honor, that my time has expired. You can I, finish your thought. And, um, the judge's and what the court has said is that it looked at habeas and it said, well, habeas exists uh, predominantly to address this particular issue. So even if there were remedies that existed beforehand, the fact of the matter is that substantive statutes, even if they on their face cover the conduct, will not permit, will not be permitted to operate in instances where the procedural requirements of habeas are one thing and another yeah. statute is another. All right. Thank, Thank you, you Your very Honor. much. Yes, you. you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chief Judge, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Madeline Shu, and today I represent the appellee, Plainsboro University. In its 2013 decision in Nassar, the Supreme Court embraced long-standing principles of tort law and holding that causal language in anti-discrimination statutes must be interpreted to require but-for cause unless Congress has specifically indicated otherwise. Despite no such indication in the language of Title IX, the appellant today is asking this court to apply an entirely different standard of causation to retaliation claims brought under that statute. And why couldn't Congress do that? Why couldn't Congress look at the special context of education and say, in this educational arena, we think it is important to make these remedies completely available. And so we're going to give one blanket statement of what the rule is, and from that rule, we will draw everything. Well, Your Honor, Congress absolutely could have encoded motivating factor causation into the text of Title IX, but they didn't. And instead, the text of Title IX is consistent with default, default principles of tort law. But the text of Title IX is the text of a spending clause statute, and, and so we're reading a lot into it. I'd like you maybe to consider the proposition that these lines that are very sharp in other areas, such as status discrimination versus retaliation versus harassment, are in fact not so cleanly drawn for Title IX. We have the statement in Jackson against Birmingham Board of Education that Title IX's private right of action encompasses suits for retaliation because retaliation falls within the statute's prohibition of intentional discrimination on the basis of sex. Well, if that's what it is, then you surely would not have a rigorous but-for causation standard of motivating factors, the standard that's normally used for assessing whether this kind of discrimination has occurred. Well, Chief Judge Wood, what I would say to that is that the Supreme Court, again, as my opponent has noted, has never addressed the proper standard of causation to be applied under Title IX. But what I want to know is why you think the Supreme Court, in light of the language in Jackson, is signaling that, or maybe you're taking an across-the-board approach. Maybe you're saying that all of Title IX, whether it's the basic prohibition against discrimination, whether it's harassment, whether it's retaliation, is all but-for. Is that your position? Because that, at least, I could understand. Yes, Your Honor, that is our position. Because the only causal language in Title IX is the phrase, on the basis of. And on the basis of is consistent with those default tort principles that the Court articulated both in Gross and in Nassar. It's a Rorschach test. It could mean almost anything. I mean, it certainly could mean that one of the factors that was on the basis of a motivating factor that led you to take this action was sex discrimination. And in a world where that is the norm under Title VII, and Title VII provides the template for sex discrimination cases, why don't we just make life easy and stay with that? Well, Your Honor, on its face, on the basis of is an idiom that falls in the same family as phrases such as by account of or by reason of, which the Court in Gross held to indicate but-for cause. But we also know that they essentially have the same meaning, that on the basis of has the same meaning as because of. So before- It just means it's a reason. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So before that, we had Price Waterhouse before Gross. And as I understand it, under Price Waterhouse, the majority of the Supreme Court said the standard for a basic discrimination claim under Title VII was motivating factor. And the language of the statute at that point, I think, was because of. So we know that because of accommodates motivating factor because the Supreme Court has told us that. And if that's true under Price Waterhouse, then why isn't the baseline test for discrimination under Title IX also motivating factor 
becomes Judge Price Trina Boston, respectfully, uh, we don't necessarily agree with that interpretation of uh, Price Waterhouse and the Supreme Court's response to it. Isn't that what the Supreme Court said in Nassar? The, the Justice Kennedy's opinion in Nassar looked at Price Waterhouse and said that there were six justices in Price Waterhouse that decided that the standard was motivating factor, and that that was reaffirmed by codification in the 91 Civil Rights Act. But the, the Supreme Court addressed the issue before the motivating factor language appeared in the statute. And the Supreme Court said under Title VII, at least six justices said in Title VII, which is a majority, even if you cobble them together from different opinions, uh, six justices said it was, motiv it was motivating factor under a because of text. Well, what the court said in Nassar and what it also said in Gross was that because of the 1991 amendments to Title VII, what those did was that it abrogated that uh, uh, Price Waterhouse. And what it said was that essentially this motivating factor causation standard was not an organic part of that statute. But, but it, I, I don't, it, uh, to me, it doesn't matter what Congress did later because what I'm looking at is what a court does when it looks at language. And yes, uh, Congress, of course, can abrogate a Supreme Court decision on statutory interpretation by telling us what the standard is under that statute. But when you look at what the Supreme Court did initially when it faced the language, six justices in Price Waterhouse said, we read because of to mean motivating factor. And if that's what six justices said in Price Waterhouse with because of, why wouldn't three lowly courts of appeals judges who are looking at by reason of, which under your argument is the same thing as because of, that's it's your own argument, why wouldn't we say, just like the six said in Price Waterhouse, we'd say the same thing here. Well, Your Honor, that's because, again, in Gross and in Nassar, the court subsequently held that because of language and by reason of and on basis of language means but for cause because Congress legislated these anti-discrimination statutes uh, against the background of default principles of tort law, which require a but for standard of causation to be proven. But it's doing a lot more in the 1991 amendments. There's, it's drawing a balance. It's adopting part of part Price Waterhouse. It's putting some caps on things, you know, shifting burdens around. So, so it's, it's fine-tuning the language, which I don't read as, as uh, abrogating the, the rationale of Price Waterhouse. They're just addressing the situation in a more nuanced way. Gross uh, and Nasser uh, are looking at because of, uh, and we, we don't have that. And I, uh, you know, I, I just don't see where, um, we don't stick with the baseline since we have no indication that Congress uh, repealed by implication any part of Title IX. Well, Your Honor, I think there are two authorities here that could be instructive on the proper interpretation of on the basis of. One is that Congress seems to use on the basis of and because of as equivalent phrases. Because if you look at Section 2000EK in Title VII itself, the definitions clause, uh, Congress uses uh, the same definition for the phrase on the basis of sex and because of sex. And those two phrases are used interchangeably throughout Title VII. So Congress itself uses those two phrases as if they mean the same thing. Can I just ask you a question as a matter of ordinary English? So if somebody comes up to you and says, um, you know, uh, you made this, the following decision yesterday. Um, what was your reason for that decision? And then the response was, you know what motivated me? And the following thing motivated me. Would you think that the person who asked the question would say, no, no, that's not the question I asked. I didn't ask about whether something motivated you. I asked what was the reason you made your decision. Uh, possibly, Your Honor, because what you're asking for here is really the straw that broke the camel's back, is what is the reason, the basis on which you made your decision. So and you, you are saying that there's only one but for cause? Uh, I thought it was well established that there could be numerous but for causes. <clears throat> There could be numerous but four causes, Your Honor. The third restatement recognizes multiple concurrent causation, but motivating factor causation is not the same thing as multiple concurrent causation, which is one method of proving causation, in fact. Multiple concurrent causation requires that multiple wrongs be occurring in parallel um, in order to find that that's a but-for cause, and that's not what motivating factor causation is, because the university's legitimate reason for firing Mr. Chase is not a wrong. And so what the appellant is purporting here to satisfy that but-for causation requirement that was articulated in Gross and in Nasser uh, simply doesn't match up to, to what tort principles recognize. I'm struggling with Nasser because it was so clear in differentiating broad general language. You know, that's just, uh, isn't that a simple problem for you that Nasser said, unlike Title IX and this would be, if, if Title VII had been phrased in broad and general terms, 
Why doesn't that tell us the answer to the question? Well, Judge Stranch, the reason is because that specific language is actually cabined to a particular part of the, the court's opinion in Nasser. And the way that appellate cites it um, actually divorces that language from its context. But what doesn't, doesn't the understanding of the court that Title IX is different and distinct in the way it uses its language, why would that be limited to only one application if you're making the determination that the two statutes are different, why wouldn't that come into play every time you talk about a comparison between the two statutes? Well, there's two reasons, Judge Tranch. One is that in Nassar, when the court differentiated between broad statutes and narrow statutes, it was responding directly to the respondent in Nassar's contention that the court should simply read a retaliation provision into the status-based protection provision of Title VII, the portion that's explicitly modified by motivating factor language. And when the court distinguished from broad statutes, it was responding to the argument that that's what they should do, because that's what they did in Jackson um, when the court read a retaliation provision into the facially sex-based protection of Title IX. And what the court in Nassar was doing when it made this distinction was it was saying that it couldn't read a retaliation provision into the status-based protection of Title VII because uh, that provision already existed in a because, separate party. Right, because yeah. there was already a retaliation provision, so the court's not going to do that. But if it's got a broad-based statute, which it has, in fact, already read to encompass retaliation, why don't we have a consistent method of interpreting it that's that's unchanged over the years and not affected by the 91 legislation. Well, Your Honor, we can look to how the federal courts and actually the Supreme Court have treated Nassar's application since it was handed down to answer that question. Uh, since Nassar was handed down, the federal courts have applied it to both broad and uh, detailed statutes. It's been held uh, to require but-for causation in retaliation claims brought under Section 1981, Section 1983, uh, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the First Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, the False has the, Claims has Act. The, um, has the D.C. Circuit addressed that? I'm especially interested in what that court thinks about these <laughs> issues. Not the D.C. Circuit, okay. Your Honor, but the District of Columbia, the district itself, has actually applied Nassar to Title IX claims for retaliation claims. Claims. And in fact, so has the Seventh Circuit. Can I, can I ask you this question? So, uh, <laughs> we, no one pays can attention I, to what they say. <laughs> my, my reading of the circuits that do that interpretation is that they did no analysis whatsoever. They simply assumed the applicability of Nasser. So, how can that give us an intellectually honest understanding of the basis of that choice? Well, Judge Strange, you are correct. This is essentially a case of first impression because the other courts haven't engaged uh, in detail with this analysis and haven't looked at the text of the statute. Um, but what I wanted to say earlier was that in, in 2016, in a case called Heffernan versus City of Patterson, the Supreme Court cited its own opinion in Nasser for the proposition that all retaliation claims are subject to a but-for causation. Well, and can that I, can was I ask the, you this question on that score? So suppose that you just assume, I know you're gonna resist this, but. Assume that I disagree with you on what the causation standard is for a standard discrimination claim. And I think it's motivating factor because that's how I read Price Waterhouse and I'm gonna apply that understanding here. If I think the basic standard for a gender discrimination claim under Title IX is motivating factor, would you still tell me that because of Nasser, I should say that the retaliation standard is but for? Yes, Your Honor, that would be our position because that's simply what the text of the statute tells us. What Nasser But I've already told you that I think that the text for, for a standard discrimination claim is motivating factor. And so, so I think the question is, can you, sh can you tear them apart? Could you have a difference under mm -hmm. Title IX? No, Your Honor. We believe that the statute rises and falls together. Only okay. one standard of causation applies. And that's actually something that Justice Kagan noted uh, during the oral arguments for Nasser is that Title VII is the only anti-discrimination statute in which multiple standards of causation seem to apply. In every other anti-discrimination statute, there's only one standard of causation. And again, the court's default assumption is that but-for cause applies. And so absent some indication that Congress intended something different, we can't read in a different standard of causation. And, and that is not read in through the fact that there is one broad overarching statement that references on the basis of sex. And so there's no division in that Title IX language. Why would you draw from that the indication that, that you cannot then impose 
in the, you cannot then impose that motivating factor across all of the streams that flow from Title IX. Well, because in the cases where the court or another a federal court has held that motivating factor applies, that language is really specific in the statute. For example, Title VII is one motivating factor is what it says. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act is another. It specifically codifies contributing factor um, as the proper causation standard. And the same is true in the Family Medical Leave Act, which is the only statute since Nassar was handed down where it's been found that motivating causation is the proper standard of causation. So am I understanding that you would say then but for? You would disagree um, with the panel and you would say that but for causation applies to all of Title IX? Yes, Your Honor, that is our position. I mean, isn't that what you have to end up with under your argument? Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. And so if we disagree with that on status-based discrimination, um, tell me how that, how that would work under your analysis. Uh, well, Your Honor, I see my time has expired. Can I address that yeah, question? Please. It is possible that you can read into the language in Jackson that there's an additional causal link required um, in Justice Sotomayor's opinion when she says that when someone is retaliated against because uh, they complain of discrimination, that that's discrimination on the basis of sex, that that creates, it creates an additional causal hinge um, that separates retaliation out from the other, uh, the other status-based dis discrimination claims. And on those bases, Your Honor, we ask that you affirm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brinster, rebuttal. Your Honors, I would like to make two quick points in rebuttal. The first is uh, in relation to Apelli's point that Brown v. General Services Administration somehow supports an argument for preclusion. I would note that there, the court simply held that federal employees were limited to suing under Title VII because that's because Congress intended federal employees to have no other remedy. And in fact, in that case, the Supreme Court said that, quote, in the context of private employment, Title VII did not preempt other remedies. A second is in relation to the Title VII damages cap. We do not believe that this somehow precludes relief under Title IX or indicates that Title IX is in conflict with Title VII. That's because, tellingly, when Congress enacted Title VII's damages cap, it explicitly preserved all available relief, including damages beyond the statutory cap under the Civil Rights Act of 1866. To us, that indicates that Congress did not intend to limit the potential recovery for plaintiffs who are seeking a private right of action under similar statutes that also um, protect against employment discrimination. We once again ask this court to reverse. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Stein. May I proceed? Your Honor identified the precise fatal reasoning flaw in the appellee's argument when you asked whether but for standard is the causation standard across the board. Unlike courts and Congress, which have done some analysis, the courts that have held otherwise have done, as Judge Stranch said, no analysis whatsoever. But their position that but for causation applies across the board for all Title IX claims contravenes the six judge justices that Judge Srinivasan references in Price Waterhouse Cooper. It contravenes Congress's affirmative decision to amend the 1991 Act, of, to amend Title VII in the 1991 Act. It contravenes Justice Kennedy's holding in Nasser, and it also contravenes and undercuts the appellee's basic position that Title VII jurisprudence guides Title IX claims. If that is not true, Your Honors, we have no reason to be here because Nasser would not apply. It's not true. Title VII should guide, and the teeth of Title VII and the teeth of many anti-discrimination statutes hold that the general standard is motivating factor causation. That is what should continue to apply until the Supreme Court says otherwise, or Congress, neither have. And for these reasons, your honors should reverse the district court's order granting summary judgment and should remand to the district court for further proceedings. Thank you. Thanks to all counsel. The court will take this case under advisement and we will be in recess. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. The court's in recess. Have a seat. So, so if I, I can have everyone's attention for just a brief moment. Um, I know a number of you have things to get to, uh, but I'll be brief and we have some things to celebrate. Uh, first of all, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Randy Brown and I am the editor-in-chief of the Moot Court Board. Actually, as of this moment, I am no longer the editor-in-chief of the Moot Court Board. So I want to say thank you. Thanks, guys. I want to say a brief thank you while I have the mic to everyone who made this year what it was, um, to my executive board, and perhaps even more importantly, to those who were not on the executive board but stepped up all the time, went above and beyond the call of duty, and made this an incredibly special year. So thank you all. Let me also be the first to congratulate our four finalists on an excellent argument. Please give them a round of applause. Now, as the judges deliberate, we have some celebrations, um, some things to um, recognize from both the fall and the spring semesters of Marden. For those who don't know, Marden is actually a year-long competition. Those in front of you today participated in preliminary rounds in fall, in semifinal rounds in spring, and then are now here today. And uh, we have a number of awards as a result of the competition throughout. So to present those awards, uh, Dean Trevor Morrison. Thanks, uh, Randy, and let me um, be the second to congratulate our finalists on a really terrific performance. Uh, this was a challenging set of questions posed by three outstanding judges, and you, and you each did a, a terrific job. I think it's Robert Jackson who said, um, I'm positive it's Jackson, but I think it's him, who said that for every case he ever argued at the Supreme Court, he really argued it three times. There was the argument that he rehearsed the night before, um, you know, and trying to anticipate questions, posing the answers they thought would be best, trying on different ones. There's the actual argument, which was just a devastating bloodbath, where he felt like um, it was just trying to hang on for dear life. Um, and then there's the perfect argument he made the night after, when he realized the best way to answer the most challenging questions. Um, I think you showed that it's possible to do that argument the night after, actually on the day of. And so, congratulations to each of you. Um, so. To business. Uh, we have some awards uh, to present, um, the first being the Albert Podell Moot Court Advocacy Award for the best overall performance by a member of the Moot Court Board in the fall preliminary round of Marden, and that goes to Catherine Whitman. Next, the Albert Podell Oral Advocacy Award for Best Oralist in the Fall Preliminary Round, and this goes to Alexander Levitt. <laughs> Who's not here? <laughs> um, the, uh, he still gets the check. Right? Yeah, okay. Um, the Podell Best Brief Writer Award for Best Brief in the Fall Preliminary Round goes to Benjamin Morris. The Martin Brief Writing Award for Best Brief Written in the Spring Finals Round of the Martin Competition goes to Madeline Shu. Okay, uh, next uh, we're going to recognize um, the semifinalists, and so the semifinals advocacy awards for those who progressed to the spring semifinal round based on superior performance in the fall preliminary round of Martin. And for these, I would like each person to stand and let's recognize all of them together once I've, um, once I've named each of them. So first, Alexander uh, Kristofkak. I don't know if I've got that right. Thank you. Uh, Alexander Levin, Aaron Mattis, Benjamin Morris, Renata O'Donnell, David Needham, Samuel Seham, and Krista Staropoli. 
there is very little suspense in this next set of awards, but we have finalist awards for the four finalists who advanced <laughs> to the final round, and I bet you can guess who they are. Jeremy Brinster, Catherine Stein, David Mosman, and Madeline Shu. So please come up in turn. hear uh, the judge's answer to um, the final question, that is namely, who is the Martin Award winner, him or herself? Um, judge Wood will announce that on behalf of the panel. Um, but again, let me just say congratulations um, to all of you for a terrific performance. You've done the law school very proud today. So with that, talk amongst yourselves. We'll call the court back to order as soon as they're done deliberating. Uh, but thank you again all for being here. This has been an incredible final argument.